our second panel of the day, sponsored by Houston Gamers. We're doing a day of diversity. If you saw YouTube, we're at our panel this morning, basically discussing our organization or whatever and how we deal with diversity. Not how we deal with diversity, but how we, how diverse we are, you know. Uh, today, our panel is inspired by, how many of you know about the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance that just passed, you know, here in Houston? The HERO Ordinance. How many of y'all heard about that? The bathroom ordinance or anything like that? <laughs> Nobody? Think of the children. Think of the children. Everyone, Think of the children. Is, everyone is raising their hands. The hand. bathroom ordinance. I'm, I'm making sure they call. So, oh, yeah. they, they just, uh, you know, uh, ordinance this <laughs> panel was inspired by that because, uh, to me, I got really, in, personally, I got really involved with Houston Equal Rights Ordinance um, and really wanted to see it through. and. We actually weren't sure if it would have to go to the ballot or not this past week. Right. But it doesn't. The petitions did not. You know, the petitions, the opposition gained against it. You know, did not meet the marker. So we kind of went like, man, we don't have to do it anymore. Uh, or, well, yes, we do. You know, we always have to push for equal rights. But we're still going to do a panel, basically talking about equal rights. My name is Jacques Bourgeois. I'm the Vice President of Houston Gamers. I'd like to introduce you to my panel here. My panel of wonderful people. Uh, let's start on the end with Mr. Fernie. Fernie, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Fernie Reyes. I am uh, a member of Houston Gamers and I operate sort of strategic board in it. And it's long term. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kimberly McGuire. I'm one of the co founders of Houston Gamers. I'm Mike Wu. I'm the creator and writer of Elflandia. I'm Jeannie Olegate. I'm part of MI6, which is one of the planning committee for Houston Gamers. Can we all get a round of applause for Mr. Michael here? Yes! He's our guest today. Can you tell us a little? Well, actually, you know what? No, I'm just kidding. I'm uh, kidding. Watch, but, uh, watch it, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you I'll be fine. I promise. He's not ordinary, guys. <laughs> what we're going to really talk about today is... Actually, let's talk about Houston Gamers, what we are. Sure. Uh, yeah. What we're going to talk about today is, you know, diversity and really how the geek world has mainstreamed a lot of important issues, you know, like the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance, which is our starting base, you know, and they would call it the Hero Ordinance. You know, the fantasy world, you know, is... I keep saying you know. Don't Somebody know. make me stop. Stop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a drinking game now. Oh God. The, the fantasy or geek world has always been a nice metaphor for getting important social itch, socio economic economical. Am I saying that right? Socioeconomic. 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 Thank you. Issues across to the mainstream media and mainstream America and getting them involved. Um, I'm going to open the floor to Mr. Michael here, who has uh, actually an app you're de developing uh, we have an, Elflandia. Yeah, we have an app that we're trying to create, and it is for that too. It's all based on a storyline that I wrote. Uh, Elflandia is a, um, is actually fits very strongly into what we're writing here in that I take aspects from the real world, this world, I put it into a fantasy world, which has elves, story survival elves, magic, and monsters, to tell the stories back to us here. So a lot of the things that uh, we had had discussion about mm -hmm. with respects to how Star Trek did for race and X-Men did for HIV uh, through the legacy virus and yes. such, that storyline is the exact type of content that I write about for this world. See? So it's a lot of fun, it's very powerful, but it, it's also a subtle way of getting that message out there without being too confrontational, too pushy, that sort of thing. And, and really gender broken, but it, it's, it, it's, it's in a format that people like to digest and they want to see as well, too. Yes. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, how many of you, let's just get jump right into this, knew that X-Men was basically a metaphor for dealing with race in the world? I honestly, I, I honestly, this morning, this morning. This is you told me maybe I told, I can, two months ago, yes. I had no idea. Go ahead. So, so one of the more interesting things about the X-Men universe, you think about it, it sort of set in many ways sort of the contemporary debates of on the African American community for a very long time. You have the representation of the Malcolm X perspective and the Martin Luther King perspective, which had existed before with W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, Rex Xavier, uh, and Magneto serving as the two dichotomy 
well, one in assimilation, this attitude towards sort of participating in the world, then one more radical perspective. And they've always been antagonistic, but it sort of interacted. And so it's really interesting how the X-Men universe has sort of seen this played out. What if you gave them true power? And so yeah. what does that look like? And so, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna say I'm the most devout fan of the X-Men, but what I think is very interesting is how there are many different ways in which the, you know, the geek world sort of encapsulates these issues in subtle ways, because they, that's where they gather inspiration. You know, Mike over here is getting inspiration from the real world. And in many ways, it's easier to talk about these metaphors that are not so explicit. And so that's one of the big ones. I know that that's one of the more important ones that sort of noticed in the world of uh, comic books. Uh, but on a real, things like, you know, Archie sort of died. The, the adult Archie died uh, mm -hmm. recently, uh, taking a bullet for uh, oh his his, his gay, gay friend, right. his, his yeah, gay yeah. friend, and so right. that that's an example of a little bit less subtle interpretation of the importance <laughs> yeah. of the gay community. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely something where you know representations of diversity are extremely important. I mean, one of the things you'll notice, and I think this will be a new frontier for American the American gay community, is definitely going to be the incorporation of Latino perspectives within the wider gay community. I mean. Star Trek broke some barriers with race, but you know my brown, my fellow brown people were still not really too involved in the broader geek world and just sort of representation things like that. And so that's going to be a next avenue because some ways gay, uh, homosexuality is becoming sort of finally breaking through in its public perception. So I think it's really exciting to see that kind of development. Um, normalization. Once you start seeing something happening in media, it starts telling you a story of what's happening in the real world. Yeah. Um, and that's really exciting. Yeah. One of the things I'm going to tell you really quick about Fernie, Fernie is an AP English, AP... I'm an AP United States History and World History teacher with a oh. degree in history from Yale, so this oh, is what I do. Wow. Wow. This is what I do in my life. I know. Also, this is my smarty pants, just by the way. <laughs> he likes to tell me all the time he's smarter than me. And I know, he you is. told me this. <laughs> I, I, I do not humble brag, Jock does it for me. <laughs> you know, one thing I'd like to say about that with respect to X-Men is that if, if you look through the comics and the storyline and that sort of thing, um, they definitely talk about uh, the mutant problem, so to yes. speak, being, you know, the diversity, that sort of thing. But when it comes down to racial issues mm -hmm. that they talk about, they talk of it as if, oh, that's old news. Right. You know what I'm saying? As if, you, as if, as the if story it's lies, already passed. It's already evolving you know, beyond that, and we're talking about something that's at a higher ground, a yeah. higher moral ground. And if you ever looked into, how many of you are Star Trek nerds? Or oh. really into Star Trek? They all raise your hand. Yeah, same thing there. It, so. You know, in Star Trek, you know, they, they, you, they will say very nonchalantly, oh, race, that's a non-issue. Yeah. You know, I remember seeing an episode of Voyager where, you know, race and money are no longer an issue to them. Right. It's just like... We've, we've, we've outgrown it. Um, <laughs> but, but it's such an interesting thing. What, what, what you see in Star Trek, so more popular, and then it's the, it, it has a, 90, a very 90s conception of race. Yeah. You know, in the 90s, we have these distinct cultures. There's the, there's the African American culture, there's the Latino culture, there's the Asian culture, and they interact and respect each other's tolerance. But it's always really weird in that you don't ever see a lot of mixing of ideas and culture, this sort of synthesis that we're seeing now, right? Where you got, you know, someone like Pitbull, however you may feel about him, you know, is definitely Ooh. Pitbull. I'm mean, actually making the point about Pitbull. Alex. Yeah. Not, you know, Pitbull's got a lot of syncretic, really cool energy of lots of different kinds uh -huh. of cultures. That, you know, even even race issues in sci-fi and in, in the geek world are sometimes, you know, you're right, trying to elevate them so morally that they're sort of detached, but in a very sort of like plastic way that like very self-contained, I think it's going to be an interesting challenge to see the world sort of break out of that. And I think groups like gamers help do that at some level. Yeah. Jenny was telling me something just interesting a minute ago about... Um, um, Star Trek. If you notice like in the original Star Trek 2, uh, one of the people, Ohura, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. but I, I apologize yeah. if I missed okay. okay. yeah. told her to keep on going. <laughs> yeah. um, she, right. she, not only was she African American, but she was a girl, and she true. was the only girl on the bridge. If you notice, there That's isn't true. a lot of women no. in true. early like sci-fi programs, and if it was, it was like, oh look, it's Barbarella, and it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, what? I've never heard of that character. It's like, I'm <laughs> joke uh, yeah. and it's you know what I mean she was like the first like a girl actually doing something yeah, I just watched rewatched Deep Space Nine recently from start to end and it's amazing Jim. as an adult seeing some of the themes in there they really 
take on the religious aspect, especially in, in the U.S. and how it tries to control things, and even how it tries to hold down, you know, go after homosexuality. So even in the newer deep space, deep space science, a great Does social. Really? Yeah, there's a lot of social commentary with the Bajoran religion and how um, how they I, use it for power and how mm -hmm. Kyle pa or Kai Wynn uses it to, yeah. you know, for her own personal power. There's a lot of social commentary in Controlling deep space mind control. Yeah. Most yeah. is really yeah. what it is. Yeah. Society's on mind control. Welcome, everyone, to the panel. Welcome, welcome. I, I love that, like, comedians, stand-up comedians used to make jokes, like, during the 90s and beforehand. It's like, ain't it funny? Ain't no black people in the future. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> but, but, I mean, it, it, it brings up this interesting perspective of, well, is this what genocide is going to look like? Do oh. or, 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 is that a horrible thing to say? You know, uh, you say it, but I mean, they would joke about it. Right. You know, but whoever's writing this thinking, well, they don't exist or whatever, so right. they're not represented. You know, in my own personal experience or my own personal, you know, view, to me in the future, everybody's going to be a mulatto, anyways. You know, <laughs> we're not already. <laughs> You know, so I just assume everybody's going to look Brazilian and pretty. Uh, <laughs> I'm already there. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, but that's, 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 that's getting way off the topic or whatever. But um, Kimberly, yes. you and I and um, a friend of ours, we were talking about how, you know, whenever comics and geek culture actually take very serious issues like race or whatever and try to push it as is, you know, not make it a metaphor, not kind of jump, what's the word I'm looking for? Hop around the bush. Beat. Beat around the bush. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what country are you from again? It's been a long day. It's been a long day. <laughs> but the thing is, whenever they don't beat around the bush and go straight ahead with the issue, uh, a friend of ours was showing this this issue of Lois Lane from what was it, 1969? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. 1968. Where a Lois Lane, I'm Lois Lane, Superman's girlfriend was the title of the comic book. And Ooh. she decided that she was gonna go be friendly with all the black people. And in Little Africa. <gasps> little Africa. In little Africa. <laughs> and like, that's what it was called in Metropolis. And so she went and she was trying to talk to everybody and nobody wanted to talk to white Lois Lane. Like even, and there was even this little blind lady. Here's, here's what's going <laughs> <She's laughs> This sitting little next blind to black lady who was sitting next to her on the bus stop. And she was like, I don't know why anyone, no one will talk to me. This lady, she's doing this inner monologue. This lady at least will sit here and talk to me because the woman, the old woman was blind and Couldn't see her. sitting there and just talking to Lois. And Lois <laughs> opens her mouth. She's like, I don't understand why anybody won't talk to me. Like then she gets up and she's like, Oh, why? And walks away. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's wow. back to Lois Lane looking sad and white on a park bench. Oh. And that's that like exactly the panel. The that's exactly what it says. And <laughs> to make it even worse, she goes back to like. Superman is following her because, you know, Clark, she told Clark she had this assignment in Little Africa. <laughs> Clark is concerned. like, I better go watch her. Yeah. Which, like, this is the most racist thing I've ever read. Yeah, this crazy. is page two. You know? <laughs> oh, honey, it, gets, it, gets, it, gets, it gets a little worse. You know, but it turns it around like Superman meets her in Little Africa. She's like, I'm so distraught. You know, and he's like, let me fly you to the Fortress of Solitude where I have this machine that will turn you into a black woman for a day. You know, and it's like, oh, yes. oh yeah. no. you can I, read it I literally stopped reading there and the went like, oh my gosh. I read like, the whole thing. You're not to go straight forward with issues like this. Like, in comedy, it, that's when it goes horribly bad. You know, and it's like, this is just awkward for everybody. You know, it's just But they weird. tried. They tried. You know, they were at least pushing you know, this issue way before it was accepted. Yeah. You know, or white people to think about what black people cared about. I know? also think it's... And, and it's, you know, it was actually very groundbreaking for the time. And yeah. Spider-Man did a comic with Planned Parenthood in the 70s oh, wow. about, uh, like, yeah. you know, people don't <laughs> want these kids one. to be able to take birth control and they're giving them misinformation. It's very in line with actually what's happening today if you look at it. Yeah. And yeah. so they were, you know, Spider-Man's like, 
we can't allow this to happen. We have to tell our kids the truth and let them, you know, be able to take birth control. It's the weirdest thing. Kids. And uh, so it is. Get them from Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider-Man. It's so random. And just look up Spider-Man and Planned Parenthood and you'll find it. It's, I think it was from like maybe Seriously, birth control was legal in 72 in for unmarried women. So, yes. So I think it was probably about like 70, maybe 72, 73. I just think, I think it's also interesting sort of like thinking of like the wider involvement of the geek community, you know, the anim, you know, the anime community sort of has very strong interaction with the broader geek community. And one of the things you see that that's sort of interesting is sort of, I think it sort of complicates. You know, sometimes we see, you know, I think American media for a large part is trying to broach the topic of race. Yeah, we're gonna do that. But you see, it, so much of how the geek community today sees itself is through the lens of anime, where we see basically individuals that are, that look white but are supposed to represent Japan. Yes. Yeah, um, right. You see right, yeah. and in conversations right, about race right, yeah. that don't functionally exist, you know, I have a guilty pleasure. I love this anime called Prince of Tennis. Uh, it is 176 uh, episodes of children playing tennis. And I, <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, one of my favorite wow. episodes, I don't know how else to describe it. Adolescents playing tennis, I guess, I don't know. Um, incredibly popular series in Japan that became very popular in the U.S. too. Wow. And this was our one representation that race existed in the world. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's like sex in the city. <laughs> <laughs> when we finally took it to the it took to the first movie until we finally saw someone that was black that didn't just exist to live Carrie Bradshaw's fantasies. Right. Uh, I know. So, point being, I just think all of this is interesting. We have different spectrum on this and on gender issues. I mean. Mm -hmm. I, I got a Let's question. Talk Let's talk about gender. I think I, <laughs> yeah. I love talking about race, but I feel like uh, us, men, is us highly us men yeah. mm -hmm. us men speak to talk, to talk too much, and I it's think so we're, we're being yeah. mansplaining. So let's talk about gender. I.e. Lucy. So, so for me growing up as a gamer, I was always a tomboy. I marched a bass drum in high school. I was one of two girls in the entire school district. I played a lot of video games. I'm, I'm older than most people in the town. I'm nice. almost 40. And, well, you know, I grew well, up... That's 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 I said almost. 26! <laughs> but, you know, and I grew up in a time with the original NES and the Super NES and all that. And there was never a girl... Well, outside of Metroid. But there was never a girl character. I mean, when I played the, our role-playing games, uh, I didn't start dating until I was older in high school, but it was always me picking my friends' names, like boys that were in band with me. My 